This rather serious fellow is named John. Susan is molding clay while Jim watches. Bill? Well, quite obviously, Bill has just had his feelings hurt. There is certainly nothing unusual about John, or his friends for that matter, except they are a few of the children who go to Pine School. Hello, and welcome to a discussion of what we feel is one of the most interesting and one of the most valuable educational facets of your university, the Pine School Project. In the next few minutes, you'll be seeing and you'll be hearing about a few of the activities of Pine School. But first, I'd like to introduce two of the people who are very important to the operation of the Pine School Project. Gloria Kimball, who teaches in Pine School. Gloria works in the lower division. And secondly, the director of the Pine School Project, Dr. Marlon Roll. Dr. Roll, I suspect that the answer to my first question is a bit more complex than the question itself. But very simply, what is Pine School? Well, the Pine School is a part of a larger research project. We are concerned with a, a longitudinal study of young mentally retarded children. <laughs> May I interrupt you right there? What do you mean by longitudinal? Well, we are concerned with studying the children for a long period of time, so that each subject that is accepted into the project we plan to study for a period of five years. And we are interested in uh, children who test as mentally retarded on intelligence tests and those children who come from what we consider inadequate homes. That is, homes where the income is so limited that the parents are unable to provide the kind of food, clothing, toys, social experiences as well that we consider normal or usual for a preschool child. We are uh, accept children between the ages of three and six, and we accept the ch kind of children that we would expect to go to special education classes for mentally retarded in a public school program. Well, with these things in mind, what exactly is the purpose of your study, your long-range study? Well, I'd have to point out, I guess, that most of the mildly retarded children uh, who are in special classes do come from homes with limited incomes and uh, the kind of homes that we consider inadequate. They are um, perhaps uh, suffering from the effect of the kind of home or lack of stimulation as well as uh, some other unknown factors. We are interested then in studying their development. Why are they different? How are they different from normal children? We're interested in collecting data about the way they develop. We're also interested in the effects of providing them what we would consider normal experiences. Does this change their course of development or not? In summary, I suppose we could say we are interested in it, intelligence and its development. Now, you can't measure intelligence directly, but we have to compare children and their behavior. Uh, certain kinds of behavior we associate with intelligence. And so an intelligence test is made up of some items that have been given to many hundreds of children. And uh, the examiner does the same thing, gives the same instructions, and then we compare children uh, performance with what we call the average or the norm. Now in this case, the little girl has been told by the examiner, uh, or he is explaining to her what he wants done. He's demonstrating a way he wants her to fold a piece of paper. She's observing very closely what he's doing, and she's very intent on the task. She's listening to the instructions. She's interested. She's not at all frightened. She's confident. She expects to succeed, I think. I think this is rather obvious as you watch her. She expects success. She has become used to success, and uh, she is uh, rewarded by success, as you can see. Well, before we look at a contrasting situation, I'm interested in this word, uh, retarded. Is this a malign term or misused term often? Well, I think we are concerned with what is uh, mm -hmm. mental retardation here, and I, I don't know, I want to make any general statements. 
In the past, I think too often we felt that mental retardation was always some sort of organic uh, weakness, organic deficiency. Now, in the Pine School, we admit only children where there is no evidence of a physical basis for mental retardation, where they seem to be normal physically and neurologically. And uh, then we are concerned here with the kinds of behavior that uh, produce success in a school situation, in testing situation. Well, could we, could we look at a contrast with the little girl that we've just seen? I think we have here an excellent contrast. Uh, the little boy has give, been given the same instructions by the examiner as the girl. You see, however, he starts to interfere. He puts his hands up. He, I suspect because he's uncertain, he wants to have the examiner repeat. Uh, or maybe he uh, uh, wants him to go slower <laughs> or something. But uh, a general kind of anxiety about the situation. There isn't the confidence that we saw with the little girl. His attention wasn't as good as hers. Um, you see, we're interested not only in whether or not he succeeds, but also in his attitude about it, his approach to problems. He takes the initial step, and then I think you'll see he looks to the examiner for approval. The little girl, if you remember, didn't do that. Uh, she went ahead. Her interest was on the task and the problem. His is directed in part on the problem and the task, but very much toward adult approval. This seems to be important. Questioning, he needs support. Um, the examiner is not to participate here. The child is supposed to indicate whether or not he's finished and whether the task is completed. And the little boy is a little uncertain about whether he's done. Now he sees the model again, and maybe this will uh, refocus his attention on what he's to do. He, he looks up at the examiner again. Making certain everything's all right, I guess. Uh, finally, looks and is able to complete the task. Here again, I would point out that the important thing uh, is not success or failure. They both passed the test. They both were able to fold it. They were able to follow the directions. They had sufficient motor coordination. But I think very indicative here is his uh, lack of confidence. She expected to succeed. He does not. Uh, I think experience with success is important for I young children. I think we've probably seen quite clearly a contrast between the two in the testing situation. And Now, you alluded to the home is a very important factor in the child's development. What, with these two children in mind, what sort of contrasts are there in their backgrounds that might have an effect? Well, the little girl is what we would consider normal, average. She comes from a middle class with its usual uh, modern conveniences. The boy's not so fortunate. He lives here. His parents are unable to provide a modern home. They haven't the income for it. There is no low-cost subsidized housing available in the community, so they go outside the city limits. There are no uh, city conveniences available. There are no playgrounds. They uh, aren't able to have uh, city gas. They don't know what a furnace is, you see. Uh, they don't know what a bathroom is. They uh, have no opportunity uh, for garbage collection, and the sanitary facilities are far from the best. They don't have washers and dryers. Uh, they don't have uh, most of the things we take for granted. This is the family room, the television room, the living room, the dining room, the kitchen. There are eight people living in this three-room house. They have done what they can to make it a home. The children are rewarded. Uh, you can see the art project on the wall that they brought home, one of the older children brought home from the Pine School project. We think about approved water supply. They don't have it. We look now through the dining area into the bedroom. Three children sleep on this single bed. Um, the wiring is inadequate. There's obviously safety hazards and uh, as you look at this home, you might wonder about people who complain about closet space and storage space. We try to enter the picture uh, 
in the Pine School project, every morning we send a university car to the homes to pick up the children. Uh, we take them furnish transportation because, of course, the parents are unable to provide this. I think that the children certainly come willingly, uh, are eager to go to school. The contrast and what they have to play with is important to them. I should add here, they're also eager to get home. But uh, the car will leave this home and go to other homes in the community and pick up the children for their day at Pine School. Since we have seen some of the apparent deficiencies, Gloria, since you teach the younger group, perhaps you could tell us what sort of activities you try to provide which might, and I suppose this is the wrong thing to say, which might uh, raise the children to the level where you feel that they're uh, able to enter the normal school situation? Well, I'd have to preface that with the way we feel that they are more like other children than dissimilar. And the primary dissimilarity comes in lack of experiences. Well, these group experiences which have psychological and social and emotional implications, as well as the physical and intellectual growth prospects, are the things we try to give. For example, playing together, playing separately, time to think, time to do nothing, projects, development, um, messing, stringing beads, the things other children ordinarily do in their home. Let's look at some of them here and see what what sort of things we do in school. Younger children find it difficult sometimes to enter into activities with others. As they become a little older, more sure of themselves, more knowing in ways to approach, sure the boys would like to play with the wagon together, but you have to develop a technique for an approach. He can't come up and hit the boy upside of the head. He has to ask, or maybe try, or maybe stand and wish, so the other little boy is ready to share. To learn to share is to grow. And to learn to share is also satisfying because then you have someone to play with. That's growth too. It's easier to learn to share when you have plenty of toys and plenty of things to share too, I might add. Uh, I think that it might be a little more difficult for the children we have in Pine School to learn to share than, than some others because they very often don't have enough to go around. Uh, but when you supply them with uh, enough toys, then learning to share becomes a little easier, don't you think? Here's another learning, too. Learning what's around us. What does a boy find along a creek bank, under a bridge, downtown in a window, to learn what to be afraid of reasonably, what, what you must respect, to learn what not to have to be afraid of, what you can handle? How competent are we? How confident are we that we can succeed at something? These are experiences that we grow through. We can look at it both from the child's point of view and the kind of things he thinks he's doing, the parent's point of view, what it looks like to them, and the teacher's point of view, and the supervisor's point of view. I would be interested here in the activities Gloria plans because they develop muscle control. You have to learn to use gross muscles. Large muscle activity precedes uh, good control of the body and use of fine muscles that are necessary for reading and uh, writing and this kind of thing. But you can't present it to the child as an effort to develop muscles. He has to have a motivation of his own to see that he can produce something, have it, take it home, break it up, show it off, use it, save it, trade it. He has a motive or he won't be able to learn to do it. And certainly from any point of view, we know that development uh, does follow patterns and that uh, certain experiences are necessary uh, to later development of uh, abilities and skills and attitudes. These abilities, too, have to have some sort of organization. You can't just throw out a group of disorganized behaviors and say, here, learn this, learn this. They have to tie it to something they've already known, something that they're interested in now, Excuse and something me, that will help. He'll show us how to solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Use a substitute technique. Well, the boy's motivated. He wants to get something broken or sawed. He did it. Here, I think you can see <laughs> some satisfaction with accomplishment that yeah, we saw I'm missing in the testing so. situation. This is messing, <laughs> and there's nothing at all wrong with playing and messing and daubing and smearing, feeling, 
Gooey, sticky things on fingers are absorbing to a young child. They learn through this, too. How does flour feel on a little boy's hand? How do you pour water? When do you know when to stop? You have to learn, and that means you have to have tried it. Sometimes children get disorganized ideas about what they may do or what they may not do. So if we as parents or teachers, educators, try to help the children play with the things they need to learn with, then we won't find so much surreptitious playing in the kitchen when mother's uptown. <laughs> they enjoy this. To us, this looks like play. That's work to that little girl. To know when, open the spout and it'll come out. To be able to scrape, to feel, to taste, to sense. These are ways people learn by doing. I think we said earlier that children have to have an opportunity to learn. They have to learn how to learn, if you will. And this is in part what happens here. They, the trial and error techniques. They learn if they're persistent. They can try different approaches. Uh, there are different ways to solve problems. There's someone there to help if they're needed. Um, but they are learning how to learn. They're learning what it means to succeed and have a satisfactory They're also experience. learning how to get along with each other. They're learning how to grow up and meet someone on the street or speak with their parents. I indicated that there were other aspects to the study. One of the things we're interested in is their physical growth and development. And through study, we learned, not surprisingly, that there were some nutritional deficits. Now, it is very difficult for low-income families to supply uh, ample er, protein in a diet. So since we have the children stay for lunch, we give them a high protein, low carbohydrate diet. So while we are trying to supplement their physical needs and see what effect this has on growth, we're also concerned with their social development and the way they learn. Uh, again, learning to share, learning to be polite, learning uh, social customs and table manners. As we watch here, I think you see a good example of imitative learning, you see some of the children use their fingers to eat. This little boy uses his finger, but then he looks up, sees the teacher using a fork, and without her saying anything, he uses his fork. Now this kind of imitative learning is important for children. I don't mean to imply that they only learn this at Pine School. This is something they learn uh, at home as well, but much of the learning a child does is through imitation. Much of the learning they do, too, is through sensory experiencing. Such a routine thing as brushing teeth can be a social gathering. It can be fun and taste good and feel scrubby, and it's fun to spit, too, when you get finished. These children learn without knowing they're learning. They're not told you're to learn this, you are learning this, or you should learn this. They're enjoying it. But it is important to establish routine on such things as toothbrushing and other health habits and make sure that it does become a habit. Minimal routine, but not exactly enforced, helped with, facilitated. Is it possible that you would ever get a child who is completely unfamiliar with some of these things, such as a toothbrush? Well, yes, we've had some who haven't seen toothbrushes. <laughs> uh, we hear I think is a good example of an activity which is teacher-directed. Now, uh, this is a longer coordinated planned activity where the teacher tells the children what she wants. She sets the goals. Now, she talks this through, I'm sure, so that they accept them and they help her set them. But this is a more teacher-directed than some of the other activities we've had. Gloria, maybe you would like to explain a little bit about well, uh, why you have this kind of activity and what's going on. Again, our goals may be different or they may dovetail. The children obviously are making Indian headdresses to wear, to do with as they please. They'll be their property, something that's part of themselves. For my part, I'm interested in what they're interested in. How are, they, how are their eyes and their fingers? How's their thumb and finger coordination? What are they thinking that they're making? If it's a headdress to them, that's fine. If it's stapling and coordination and careful work and thought and particularly motivation, then that's what I want out of it too. I think this is where you get a successful activity when the teacher and the children perhaps want different things and accomplish both of them, everyone happy. This is a good situation where to learn when to depend on adults and that they can use adults to 
uh, achieve success in the end here. I think uh, uh, they, the way she accepted help on the stapling and so forth, something she couldn't have done perhaps alone or wasn't ready to do alone just then. And development of emotional relationships, if you will, are this as important. This isn't a thing that you talk about with the child. It's something that <coughs> develops between the people. This also is a matter of fantasy. Children learn through, oh, conquering in fantasy, rebelling, enjoying, being maybe a little girl or a warrior, who knows? But that's makeup, they know that. Those are beads, jewelry, but the boys are just as interested in it as girls if it's presented right and if there's no one standing by to tell them, oh, little boys, don't do this. It's an so socially acceptable way to make noise and a socially acceptable way to wear makeup. <laughs> and it's a socially acceptable way to grow because they will grow through this into other things, other interests, if they're guided, helped, facilitated particularly, they'll grow on through that. They enjoy rhythm. Children enjoy movement, sound. Most of their intake is perceptual. And of course, this has the same psychological and emotional satisfactions. Some people can't participate as readily as others. They learn by watching. As he feels more sure of himself, he'll dance too. Some children are just noisemakers. Some children are absorbed in watching. So provide the experiences, you'll have the results. They're happy, you're happy, and your children have grown, and you have certainly grown through them. Well, I'm sure it would be foolish to say that we've seen all of the activities of Pine School, but well, from what we have seen, it seems to me that it raises a very important question, and that is, what have been the results of your study up to this point? Well, there have been many results. Some are easier to describe than others. I think probably the most obvious and meaningful is that of 27 children who have left Pine School, 16 have been able to go into regular public school classes for normal children and seem to be doing fairly well. Many of them are in at least the average reading groups, and we've been very pleased with this result. Now, I think that you might ask the question about the other 11, uh, and it might not sound like a good record, but when we remember that all of these children we had predicted would need special education classes, then it is a, a we consider, a very good record, and we are quite pleased with, it, with these results. Well, I, I realize you probably haven't made any detailed study of it, but regarding the 11 who weren't successful, have you, or can you make any preliminary prediction as to perhaps why not? Well, we've collected a great deal of data. We haven't had time to analyze everything. The one thing that we know at this time is that the children who are youngest at the time of admission to Pine School seem to do best. So that those who were three and four when they entered the project have done better as a group than those who were five and six. And it seems to be that the younger you start working with them, um, the earlier you begin the stimulation, the better the results. Mm -hmm. And this has been a, the only uh, significant difference, I think, that we found. With the possible exception, there seems to be a suggestion in the data that the children who uh, are testing lowest on admission also improve the most, but this isn't quite as significant as the age. Well, up, up to this point, we've been talking only about the children, which is, of course, the most important thing for our purposes right here. But uh, a very interesting thing to me is the parents. What sort of cooperation do you get? Do you find them eager and willing to cooperate? I think this has probably been one of the most gratifying parts of the study, and it's one of the things that we've been most interested in. And uh, we obviously couldn't carry on the Pine School project without cooperation from the parents. They've been very willing to attend meetings. They take tests themselves. They participate in many ways. Uh, they tell us about the way they live, the kinds of things they are able to do for their children, and it makes it possible for us to plan an effective program. I think that uh, well, very meaningful statistic again. I did keep tra uh, keep track for a while of the attendance at our monthly PTA meetings, and I averaged an 80% attendance for a period of time, and that's better than any public school in this state can boast, I'm sure. Then we can safely say you get uh, better cooperation than the so-called normal school. Well, I'm sure that any principal in Iowa who got 80% attendance at just one meeting <laughs> at a PTA would be... <laughs>
probably they have to carry him home. <laughs> Gloria, uh, do you find Pine School teaching challenging? Oh, challenging, yes, but particularly rewarding. When, when you see these little people come from so far behind and then look like just any other little boy or girl on the playground, that's real reward. Well, I would gather from your enthusiasm that you wouldn't find any trouble in recruiting teachers for this sort of teaching situation. Is this true? Well, there haven't been many programs set up for it specifically for teaching at the preschool level of this kind of children. I think we could point out here that most preschools are private. They depend on tuition and this automatically limits participation to the children who need it least. Mm -hmm. Uh, the families had to be able to afford it. These are children who have other things they need. Not that it isn't good for them, but certainly the people who have the least stimulation are the least apt to be in a preschool program. There are a few exceptions, or they're beginning to be, I think, some signs of change. I uh, just recently learned that New Haven, Connecticut is considering starting, or plans to start, I think, in another year, uh, programs for three and four year old children which will be operated by the public schools and we find this encouraging and this is particularly for uh, the less uh, adequate or the shall we say the more deprived areas of the community and um, I think that partly as a result of the Pine School project many of the public schools in Iowa have allowed children to enter the uh, special education program at an earlier age than they had before. Then, then can you safely say that Pine School is a pioneer project, the first of its kind? You mentioned this New Haven. Well, I think that the Pine School project is unique in many respects. There have been uh, other studies that have worked with some of the same problems. Dr. Kirk at the University of Illinois started a project, uh, did a project several years ago. Uh, it finished about the time Pine School began. Uh, supplying a preschool program for mentally retarded children. Now, they did not work with the families, and it was not a selected group, so that it wasn't exactly the same. There are a few other studies working with preschool children. At the moment, most of the research has been concerned with uh, medical aspects of mental retardation, or should I say the, the research that gets publicity. And I think we're just getting into uh, some useful research uh, in the areas, the social areas and educational areas uh, of the problem. Well, I suspect this is a very obvious question, but then we can say you probably predict a very bright future for Pine School and other similar projects. Well, I think this goes without saying. It has been very interesting. It's been very productive as far as the information we've gotten from the research aspect. It has also been particularly useful for training students in many areas. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rowe. Gloria, it's been a pleasure having you. I'm quite confident that what I said at the beginning of the program is certainly true. Pine School is one of the most interesting and one of the most valuable educational facets of your university. Pine School has been a State University of Iowa Television Center Production.